We're not going to do that. No. Well, we should probably move on to the, the subject of our <laughs> the actual podcast. Subject. The actual yeah, why subject not? of our podcast, which is All the Devils Are Here by David Seabrook. Should we start by asking Rachel to say why you chose this remarkable book for the podcast, other than the fact that it is remarkable? Well, the thing about it is people always say that there's no book like this, and it's just never true. But in this case, I really think there isn't another book like it. I certainly can't think of one. And to me, it's a kind of minor masterpiece that no one knows about, and I would like people to read it. When did you first read it? Can you remember? Well, there's something spooky about this book, which we will talk about. But uh, (laughs) for me personally, (laughs) it's been quite spooky. When it came out in 2002, I read a review of it. And the review made a great impression on me. But it, it was one of those things where I... It was only an impression. I couldn't remember the name of the book or the author. And I kept Googling, and I must be a really crap Googler, because (laughs) I'd type in, like, you know, Kent, murderers, weird things, you know, and and, and this book (laughs) would never... Yeah. (laughs) And the book would never come up, and it was driving me mad, and this went on for years. And then uh, in 2011, so... Yeah, quite a long time after it was yes, published. Yes, n- nine years later. Yeah. Massive name drop coming up. I was at a dinner at, to celebrate Claire Tomlin's Dickens biography, which was yeah. appropriate because Dickens is in this yeah, book, indeed. as we will discuss. And I was sitting next to Claire's publisher, who was then Tony Lacey from Viking. And he was doing that old school publishing thing of slightly <laughs> boasting about his second home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Someone did that to me last week. That's very <laughs> old school. I mean, Th- them were days. Yeah, them, them were um, the days. And he divides his time <laughs> between he divides his time between Chiswick <laughs> and, and Deal. deal. It, it, I always think when that says that on a jacket, I always think toss up. Anyway, <laughs> um, so. And he was talking about Deal, and I said, gosh, Deal, you know. And I said, you must read Roger Lewis's book about Charles Hawtrey, The Man Who Was Private Whittle. It's brilliant. And he said, yes, I've heard it's very good. Yeah, he said, I've heard it's very good, but I'm actually reading a really good book about about Thanet and the coast. Can I just interrupt you? I recommended that book to Tony Lacey. Did you? Yeah. Well done, Andy. The interconnectedness of all things. Well, anyway, and he said, I'm reading this book, it's called All the Devils Are Here. And as he said it, I became, you know, I had this goosebump thing of thinking, Uh, this is the book I've been looking for for nine years. I've been trying to find out what this book is, and here it is. So I went home, I went on to a books, I bought it. And I suppose all of us in our lives... You do occasionally have that feeling where a book comes to you and you feel like it might have been been written almost for you. Mm -hmm. It maybe happens maybe two or three times. Now, it says something very weird about me that I felt that about this book um, but I did and I, and I, I'm going to read the blur <laughs> in a minute and you, know, you can make up your own mind I just briefly say why I have a very powerful feeling about faded seaside towns yeah. As a kid, my granny used to take me to Bridlington and um, Withensea. No one's heard of Withensea. And, and even once we had a, a week at P- Pontins and Morecambe. And I had very intense experiences in these places, which I perhaps won't describe here. But So I love those depressing seaside towns. To me, a, a, a weekend in, in, in Eastbourne is like the best thing that you can do, really, and going around charity shops. And But also, a lot of the people in this book... Are peop- it sounds so weird to say this, but from my childhood. So, for instance, Richard Dad, the first painting that I ever knew was the Fairy Fellas Masterstroke because mm. I had a big postcard of it in mm. my bedroom. I don't know where it came from. Also, Dickens was our household god. My dad and my granny were that thing that might not exist now, which is working class fans of Dickens. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And they didn't really think that any other novels were like worth reading. <laughs> My granny was blind, so she'd only ever listened to them, but they'd read Dickens. What you did was you read Dickens, and when you finished, you started again. And in our hall, there was a big picture of Dickens. My dad just worshipped Dickens. My sister was called Florence for Florence Dombey. So, so there was Dickens and Richard Dad and Seaside Towns, and I just had this feeling of, awful kind of recognition and to me a lot of books people say this is such an interesting book and then you start to read it and actually there were interesting bits but there were loads of longers 
this book, there's something interesting on every page, Absolutely. in every paragraph. But I'm going to read the blurb in a minute because I think it's important that people <laughs> we tell people what the book is about to the to the extent that one can do that. But the one of the things that's brilliant about this book, yeah, I the felt sound of young Victoria. <laughs> I felt rereading. It, I felt rereading it was that Seabrook stays on the subject as long as he is interested in it and then bolts to the next one. It's, yeah. it's and it layers and layers and layers as it goes on, it's, which actually is a really high-risk strategy. I, I never, because because yeah. you would think it would be... You, you would be left with a feeling of superficiality, but actually I, I don't feel that at all. it's a short book. Yeah. It's a yeah. short book. So let, let me just read the blurb, because we can assume that lots of people listening may not have I heard this I think almost book, no right? one. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, this is what... This is... Um, I know for a fact that this blurb was written by... But it is, it, we should say it is, it is available on Kindle. It's available on Kindle at the moment, um, yeah. it, I'd very much love to see it available again. Come on, Grant, to do the right thing. Yeah. Anyway, or, or let me... Someone let else, me, like, um, unbound oh, or something like that. This blurb was probably written by... David Seabrook's editor, Neil Belton. The great Neil Belton. The great Neil Belton, who is in, uh, an author in his own right, of course. So, yeah. I'm just, but, so just let me read the, the blurb here. In his first book, David Seabrook takes us on a deranged exploration of the Kentish coastal towns of Thanet and Medway. He fuses his observation of these depression landscapes, city centres full of unemployed young men and asylum seekers and dodgy characters, with literary and historical associations that seem, through his eyes, more like bad dreams than heritage advertisements for the local tourist board. He sees the desperate jollity of Margate, where T.S. Eliot stayed after the Great War, as a key element in the making of the wasteland. He sees the desperate jollity of Margate, where T.S. Eliot stayed after the Great War, as a key element in the making of the wasteland. His Rochester and Chatham crawl with the ghosts of Dickens and the parricide Richard Dadd. In Broadstairs, site of John Buchan's The 39 Steps, he uncovers a weird network involving Lord Curzon, Buchan, William Joyce and Audrey Hepburn's father. In Deal, he stumbles on the true sordid story that lay behind The Servant, Robin Maugham's novel later turned into a film by Joseph Losey and links it to the milieu of not-so-gentle gay retirees to the coast, a network that touches on the murder of the box of Freddie Mills and the self-destruction of the carry-on actor Charles Hawtrey. Written with high energy and seriousness, disturbingly personal and surprising, this is a unique book. There are devils here and the reader will remember them. Yep. Now, I hope that makes everybody <laughs> pause the podcast and go and download a copy of this book. It's absolutely wonderful. I'm just going to say to Rachel that the circumstances under which I read this book are slightly different. I remember reading a couple of reviews of it, as you did, and thinking, oh, that sounds interesting, but not doing anything about it. And then my family moved in 2005 to the East Kent coastal town of Whitstable, where we still live. And... Um, I walked into the Remainder bookshop, the excellent Harbour Books, hello Harbour Books if you're listening, and there was a pile of copies of All the Devils Are Here, reduced in price, with a, a sign next to them saying local interest. <laughs> so, Which is such a turn off. <laughs> local right. interest is right. my worst word. Right. And especially when you know what the book is about and how seedy <laughs> and feverish it is, right? Ooh, lovely. So I picked it up and read it in on the train journey into London and the train journey back and I remember putting it down at the end and we will we'll have to say something about the ending of the book <laughs> thinking what what did I just read yeah. what what was that book and I found that it really stayed in my head for the next few weeks so I read it again and then thought whoa well, this is absolutely the energy of it I'm definitely going to read it and I finished it this morning in fact early this afternoon it is just it is sui generis, I think. I think there are things that we obviously that you can say that it, it's it's like. There are connections, perhaps, to Ian Sinclair's mm. work. It reminds me, in some ways, of W. G. Zabalt's uh, *The Rings of Saturn: Journey Through Suffolk on Foot*. But it's in its kind of mixture. It's strange, as you were saying before, Andy. The way it's it doesn't make any attempt to be coherent in the way that that most books do. The thesis, if there is one, he never really reveals what it is. It's a, it seems to me, I've never, I've never quite had the kind of hair stand up on the back of my neck in the same way. It's, it's like demonic possession. 
It's mm-hmm. like he's exploring like demonic possession without ever saying that's what he's doing. Well, also, it is a bit like House of Cards when Kevin Spacey turns yeah. and says yes. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he's, he's going along. It's quite sort of scholarly and factual. And you're thinking, ah, oh, yes, this person murdered this person. This person had sex with this person. And then all of a sudden he goes... And he tells you something about himself. Yeah. It's a bleak. It's not clear. You don't know that much about him. And then you have this chilling feeling. You feel, I think, frightened of him and frightened for him. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and yeah. you think, what's he going to do? Is he mad? Is he, is, he, is he sick? Is he a pervert? And, of course, by the time I read this book, David Seabrook was already dead. He, he died yeah. young, as they say. And, and so to, to have this feeling of being afraid of him and afraid for him. It was a very unnerving thing. It reminded me very much of when you're reading as a child. When I was a kid, I was mad on those books by Peter Haining, the, the pan book of yes. vampires. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, it, and those books were full of things that you couldn't really understand when you were a kid. You, you knew you liked them, but you couldn't understand them. And that's, I feel that about this. There are lots of things in this book that I understand. I understand that Richard Dad killed his, his father and he was a fantastic painter and he went to a loony bin. I know that. But there are so many things I don't understand about this book. Why are they in here? Why is David Seabrook like this or that? What's happened to him? Yeah. Is he gay? Is he straight? What, yeah. what, what, Why what? Why is he drawn to these? Yes. I mean, that whole sense of, of, of places, the, the house... Or in Broadstairs. In Broadstairs mm. that becomes the home to... There's a house called Noldera, which Noldera, is the scene right. of the 39 steps, which he then brilliantly <laughs> moves slightly along the coast to, to a nearby house, which is the home of Os- Oswald Mosley. The whole way he, he kind of connects that story well, with... Well, no, Lord it's not the house of Oswald, but no. no. Noldera was the house of Curzon, and Curzon's daughter, no, Cynthia, right. was married to Oswald Mosley. Yeah, 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 she was the yeah, first... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mrs. Mosley. And then Noldera then became the, the home of this man, Arthur Tester, who was a leading light in the, the British Union, Union of Fascists. Fascists. Yes. Yeah. And then the story of, that enables the story of Lord Hoho and, and, and Audrey Hepburn's dad, who turns yeah. out to be a fascist as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you just, you don't know where he's taking you, but you don't mind him taking you, even though you, you know, as they say, I, you have a bad feeling about this. I had, um, <laughs> I had a really interesting conversation earlier in the week. I rang Neil Belton up because this it was comparatively difficult to find out things about David Seabrook. So I rang Neil up, and he told me that the book came to him via David Seabrook sending one of the essays in whatever form to Ian Sinclair, mm. and Ian Sinclair, who at that time was published by Neil passed it on to Neil with no agent involved saying I think you should look at this and that thing Rachel that you were saying about Seabrook being someone you were a narrator you were afraid of and afraid for this is a thing that Ian Sinclair wrote about David Seabrook he describes him in a very Sinclairish way as a dull cue de Quincey <laughs> And then he goes on to say, refusing to allow the area he inhabits, the banishment, to become a noose, Seabrook has decided to celebrate it with a virtuoso exhibition of sardony. His franchise, the area he describes raiding and returning, is anywhere that can be reached in an hour or so by bus or train from Canterbury. <laughs> he gives true. Is, It's true, isn't it? Yeah. He gives his readers an ear bashing they won't forget. And when Seabrook died earlier this year, it was a horribly premature loss. Now this mysterious author is fated to become part of the zone he described to yeah, such yeah, effect. Yeah, yeah, an yeah. anecdote, a rumour, a legend. Yeah, that's isn't great. That brilliant. But, but a process which Seabrook is, <laughs> is well, complicit that, in, right? And, and, I mean, you're, he's absolutely right about the fact that he doesn't want to move far from Canterbury because in the book, he'll be talking to someone really fascinating and he says, well, my bus is due in a minute, yeah. I've got to go. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and, and you think, I know, so true. And, and it's funny because he doesn't quite do it. It doesn't really lay on kind of the humour or the irony, although there's a great letter at one point where somebody writes to him and says, your book of essays on Kent and its history should make interesting reading. Oh, yes, I was going to read. Yeah. I, was gonna... I, I, I just... It's so, yes, I'm writing a book of essays on Kent and its history, which is 
true, <laughs> but so not what yes, the Yes, he goes, yes, absolutely, he that's goes to Gillingham. That's yeah. the daughter of Lord Hawhoy who yeah, says that, which is a, Which is a great interview. Mm. Rachel, do you want to read like the first? Yeah. I mean, this page, the book maybe? is the book's divided yeah. into four. So there are three chapters. The first chapter is Rochester and Chatham. The second chapter is Northfall and Broadstairs, and the third chapter is um, what is it? Oh, it's Deal. Of course, it is. But there's a what he calls a prelude, which is Margate, and it's about T. S. Eliot's nervous breakdown, and he goes to Margate to write, and. I don't think I realised this at the time, but it's really obvious to me now why Seabrook used that as his prelude, because I think this book is his nervous breakdown. Yeah. And these sort of fugitive voices, bits of poem and Bible and half echoes, half rhymes, it's all kind of from the wasteland. I think the main thing, though, is that feeling of of madness and being on Mm. the edge of... So this is him in Margate... There are hunched, sedated souls lingering in cafes and souped-up milk bars. There are groups of squabbling Albanians outside. There are the young men of the front, this front, all bare arms, body art and fast-working, furious faces. Faces that ought to be spouting water from the walls of Gothic buildings. But they're here and they speak, spraying spittle. I drift past the entrance to Dreamland. Margate's main attraction opened its doors in 1920, importing the name from an amusement park on Coney Island and the main ride, the Caterpillar, from Germany. While you queued for the big thrill, you could look up at your kids looking down at you through a grill set in the huge horned head of the Snail Man, a tall wooden structure with stairs. The park was also the place to get your pocket picked and probably still is. (laughs) I mean, it, it gives you a flavour of it, although yeah. you can't quite do it justice unless you just d- devour the whole thing, I think. You know, you were saying, uh, this isn't a book like, you know, you mistrust, this isn't a book like any other. Yeah. I mistrust that you will want to read it in a sitting and then turn straight back to page one and start it again. Yeah. Well, that's right? That's a thing, is. isn't it, that people say. But this book, I feel... Ah, maybe you wouldn't want to go straight back. Maybe you want to open the window and take a <laughs> take a deep breath or two. But the benefit of reading it straight through in one go, which you could do, I think you could do in three hours if you put your mind to it. Mm. The kind of accumulation of mm. images and the feverishness of mm. it. And I mean, each of the chapters has a distinct mood. So the the chapter about Richard Dad and Charles Dickens, I mean, that's the most sort of scholarly and straightforward yeah, it's, 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 it's the most it, it, calmest. then it kind of ratchets up so he goes to investigate his fascists and there's this bloke who is he is the bloke following him he's dressed as a vicar what's <laughs> yeah. going on yeah, the, the yeah. vicar yeah yeah i mean it's terrifying it's like something out of the prisoner and he's he's going down the yes, steps yes exactly it, uh, it definitely has fit prisoner i also felt that the only person i could imagine who could film this book and it is unfilmable, is Nick Rogue. It has that same sort of strange... Yeah, that's very certainly, if we come yeah. to the ending, that the ending has a real mm, sort of Nick Rogue feeling to it. The, the pink duffel coat and the... Oh, mm, the pink duffel coat. Oh, yeah. That takes place in Deal. We have a little clip here of the section in Deal deals partly with uh, the late Charles Hawtrey, the, the carry-on actor, who, as, as you said, Roger Lewis's book lovingly paints <laughs> a horrible portrait uh, of... Could you... Could, Matt, could we just hear uh, what I believe is a taxi driver uh, describing his dealings with Charles Hawtrey in the period we're, we're talking about? Sometimes um, we used to get um, a call from his house and he'd give us a little list saying what drinks he'd like delivered there. It was normally uh, bottles of sherry or gin, sometimes some mixers. So I got the impression it wasn't just for him, but maybe he was having people down as well. But I don't remember ever having actually picked anyone else up from his house, apart from himself. And that's from a BBC documentary about the lives of Carry On Stars and specifically how unhappy they all were, which is a, a must-watch. I love, it. I love <laughs> this line from the book about Hawtrey. He said, reeling round like an old wasted weasel turfed out of Toad Hall. He performed at the drop of a hip flask for any tabloid hack who happened to be passing through. They used me and dumped me shat all over me. I could have been as famous as St James. <laughs> just, he does that sort of oh. Sebaldian thing of putting uh, black and white photos through the book, which add to the oddness of it. Duncan Fallowell said the book was 
Carry On Mar Margate rewritten as Dracula, which <laughs> that was quite good. Mm. I mean, it's the, the final section is it's just so bizarre because the stories are basically all connected by this chap Gordon yeah. who who Seabrook goes to talk to who is an old old, he, old queen he's, he's a massive old queen who's sort of shagged all these people and, and, and it's like a sort of spider sitting in his web and it takes him out to Robin Maugham yeah. to Charles Hawtrey um, and it's just and Freddie Mills, the boxer. And Freddie Mills, the boxer. Who he's had sex with. Uh, yeah. And um, it's just the most extraordinary sort of tangled web. And the way he narrates that is because he's first he says, well, a lot of people thought Freddie Mills was gay, um, you know, but obviously a lot of the people who, the, the Mills kind of historians don't, they discount it altogether. And then he says, you know, well, good for them. And then tells the story of the guy who's had <laughs> yeah, sex with yeah, Freddie yeah. Mills. Yeah. Which is a very odd kind um, of not terribly you know he, he talks the, the, the guy who'd had sex with him talks about how hard freddie mills body he'd never had sex with anybody like that but it was a sort of empty encounter uh, so this is going on isn't it and you're reading this and you're thinking whoa. like this is a web of what is this and, and you, then and then what happens and this is how the essay ends and how the book ends matthew what happens at the end of the book well occasionally there are reference to his his wife or his fiance in the book aren't they she's died and she's died and the book, and so you kind of, your there's a little echo of this that comes through occasionally in the book in these little sections that are more personal. And then at the end, why don't you, why don't you describe what happens, Rachel? Well, he's, um, he's on his way home from having seen Gordon. They've had a long chat in Gordon's cottage. That's not that. He's going to get his bus. He's going to get his bus, and he... He says, you know, it's clear that he's broke. And he says, it's a question of rent. Mm. And we all know what rent means in that context. And he goes into the pub and he gets himself a bitter lemon. Yeah. And he sits down it would be a and he waits and some blokes come in and um, he gets talking to one of the blokes. And this bloke tells him, a story about how when he was a younger man he liked boys and there was one boy he was particularly fond of and then he anyway to cut a long story short he thinks that this favorite boy of his was on the beach at deal and when he goes down to see him he's wearing a pink duffel coat and the, the he pulls back the hood and it's charles hawtrey and then you cut back to the pub where seabrook's listening to this and it's obvious that they're going to go off and have sex and Seabrook's going to be paid for this. Yeah. Or at least that's what he implies. Yeah. And that's how it ends. Which is it's just a very strange ending, isn't it? I mean, the, even that little bit about bitter lemon. So when he goes into the pub, he orders a bitter lemon. But then a few paragraphs later, he's clearly drunk and he talks about being drinking yeah. gin. Yeah. So that's even kind of weird. That even the setup for that particular scene. Well, I think the guy has <coughs> been giving him gin, right, yeah. hasn't he? And he just, yeah, right. he yeah. just thinks, well, I'm going to drink yeah. it because it's going to make it easier. Because yeah. he doesn't really have an appetite for what he's about to do. He just wants the cash. But then there were a couple of bits earlier on where he's talking to people about stuff and his first question is tell me about his cock they're quite in your face <laughs> forgive the pun <laughs> but, but, they, but suddenly they, he snaps straight into this very direct question which again thinking about the earlier section about Dickens or even T.S. Eliot mm, that's, mm, they're completely mm. they're what kind of you were saying earlier Matthew is the ending leads you quite discombobulated I think yeah but also, what were you saying? It sort of changes what all ending, what great endings do, which is make you think, what have I just read? Yeah. Rethink, yeah. recalibrate, yeah. recontextualise what it's, you it's just a, read, it's right? It's a sort of major focus pull, and you suddenly think, hell, I, I, yeah, I need to go back. There's a section in the mid, in, towards the end of the book, isn't there? The Freddie Mills section, which is also, he kind of elides that into the murders, eight women who were, who were murdered in London in the 60s. I'm going to say a bit the about 60s. that as well, yeah. The, well, Jack the Stripper murders because they were all well they were all murdered by being choked to death they were strangled and mm -hmm. stripped and then he goes on andy seabrook's next book his second yeah book, yeah yeah his well basically i'm going to say a little bit about seabrook based on what i could find out about him and what neil belton um told me which was really really interesting basically seabrook was born in 1960 this is where he grew up this area 
So he grew, grows up in Kent. He had quite a strict and Christian upbringing. He studied at the University of Kent. He did an MA in Proust. Neil told me that he was never quite sure what Seabrook did for money a lot of the time. <laughs> but he definitely operated on the edge of legality and, off, and often over the other side of it. That he had, um, <laughs> at times, done stuff he didn't feel too good about, which indeed you can... Mm. It was seeping through this book, I think. And he told me that David Seabrook would come into the Granter office and monologue about either things that he was fascinated by, which is very much what, what this book is like, mm. listening to that person, mm. or ranting at length about how much he hated nearly all other contemporary <laughs> authors, like most authors do. His two favourite writers were Gordon Lish as a writer, he's famous an as an editor. Yeah, yeah. He's Raymond Carver's he's editor. editor yeah. Yeah. A writer of his own right. No, and also the, go as a writer the ghost stories of Robert Aikman. Mm. And Neil Belton said that he had never read, nor for that matter, heard of Robert Aikman, that Seabrook lent him these, at that stage, very rare first editions of some of Aikman's books. And Neil loved them. And in turn, got them republished by Faber because the Aikman backlist came out a few years ago. David Seabrook did that. Amazing. Mm. Isn't that fascinating, is that kind of... Those little links that you were talking about that you can well, discern. Well, there are definitely ghosts in this book, yeah, aren't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a corpse-ridden book. Yeah. Uh, li literally and metaphorically. Yeah. <laughs> Could we... I just want to listen to something first. Could we talk a bit about the Richard Dad? Section. Richard Dad is probably best known uh, for killing his dad. For killing. Well, he's probably not best known for that. He's best known for appearing on the Antiques Roadshow. So <laughs> we're just we're going to listen to a clip of a Richard Dad painting being uncovered on the Antiques Roadshow. Well, the first item we saw of really enormous value. I remember was in Barnstable in 1986. It was very strange the way it, uh, it turned up. The couple who owned it didn't know the first thing about it and thought it was valueless. And they weren't even going to bother to come to the show. But the dog needed a walk, and the dog's favorite walk was in the park, right by our front door. So as they reached for the dog's lead when leaving home, they said, why don't we take that picture? We don't know anything about it, just on the off chance, we'll take the picture. So they took the picture off the wall and brought it in with Doggy. And uh, the expert that day was Peter Nahum. Now, <coughs> it is an extraordinary painting. I don't know who this painting is by. I know it's a wonderful painting. I would hope that some indications, I mean, it would be too much to hope, really, that this was a lost painting by Richard Dyer. Obviously, I've only had a, f a few minutes to yes. look at this, um, and it needs some investigation. So what I would like to ask you to do is if we may take it to London on your behalf and investigate it further. Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, we'd be interested as well. So with the owner's permission, we took the picture back to London, took it to the expert, and we said, look, is this the long-lost Richard Dad? And she said, yes, it certainly is. So then we had to go back to the couple in Barnstable, went to their bungalow with a film crew, and that's when Peter gave them the uh, good news and the valuation. It is an international treasure in a lost picture, and I feel that it could possibly um, make somewhat over £100,000. <laughs> Hugh Scully, that's proper antiques roadshow, not Fiona Bruce. Yeah, the, old, <laughs> the old school. So the painter Richard Dad. We were talking about this as the most orthodox mm. uh, essay. What does Seabrook do with Richard Dad in the essay? Well, he first of all tells the story <coughs> of Dad's madness and the fact that he murdered his father. And, of course, what happened was that Dad was taken to an asylum and he spent the rest of his days there, and that's where he painted all of his great masterpieces. But then Seabrook, he starts to think about, you know, what sent dad mad and dad went on this extraordinary journey across Europe to Egypt so Seabrook goes off on this kind of digression about opium about the Victorian passion for Egypt and then ah, he does one of his strange yeah. kind of <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. you know, he that, puts that, it. That's enough of that. Yeah, and then he <laughs> posits this extraordinary theory about Edwin Drood, Dickens' final unfinished novel. I mean, I don't know how convincing it is. I'm not a Drudist. Yeah. <laughs> but Which um, you sense that Seabrook wasn't terribly no. keen on the Drudists. But he but makes he, a link, doesn't he? He thinks that Dickens may have had the dad story may have been somewhere in, in the mix and he picks up all these clues. But I think what he does, which is really interesting, is it's almost like he makes dream connections. He's not interested in making causal exactly. connections. He lays things that have strange shapes that are similar Absolutely. next to one another and leaves it to the reader to make those kind of connections. And he's interested in sort of folk memory yeah. and things that feel familiar even though they can't possibly be familiar because you've never been there before or whatever. Mm. That kind of mm. weird... It's all about the uncanny, isn't it, a lot I, of it? I also yeah. think that, that essay is important in the structure of the book too because it, because it's the most orthodox one, it's sort of reassuring. I was just going to yeah. say, it's Isn't a it? bit of a pat on the back. Yeah. You're going to be interested in this. I'm interested in Victorian painting. Yeah, but yeah. what you find out later is I'm interest, massively interested in paedophilia and <laughs> buggery as well. And, and, murder and, <laughs> and I can use the skills I demonstrate in the Richard Dad chapter to link Dad and Drood, but don't linger over. Yeah to more subversive effect as the book goes on. Stick with me. And yeah. he's very good about the Dickens industry yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in Rochester, good. isn't he? And he really takes the mickey out of the sort of Mr Pickwick waddling down the high yeah. street and yeah. the, you know, and all of that. The it's, heritage. Yeah. 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 So, so David Seabrook died in 2009. This was his first book. His second book is called Jack of Jumps. I have a copy, but I hadn't read it until a few weeks ago when I knew we were going to be covering All the Devils Are Here. And as I started reading it, I was thinking, wow, this is great too. And actually, as it goes on, you can feel Seabrook getting weighed down by it. It's a book about the Jack the Stripper murders. He had been given access yeah. to the police files for the first time. But there's a terrible sense of, first of all, he's pretty unpleasant about quite a few of the people talked about in the book. And the second thing is there's a weariness about it. It's a 350-page book. By, unfortunately, murder number three, you can feel him thinking to himself, fucking hell, this is murder number three. I've still got five to go. It's a, it's a slog, yeah. unfortunately. But he was about, he was, when he died, he was working on another book about the... David Jacobs. Yes, David Jacobs, the 1960s show business lawyer who was Brian Epstein's yeah, lawyer. Yeah, yeah who hanged himself in his garage in yeah. Hove uh, in 1968. Um, I mean, I think that... Um, have you read Jack of Jumps? Well, uh, yeah, and I don't want anyone to read Jack of Jumps um, <laughs> because I just think it's pure distilled misogyny. I mean, it's just, I, find, I find it almost unreadable. He's mm. so vile about the women. The mm -hmm, women were mm -hmm. all mostly prostitutes. And he's so vile about them, and it's just it's it's kind of, it becomes intolerable. I mean, he's very very good at evoking the seedy side of sixties London. He's brilliant about you know milk bars and clip joints and all of that, yeah. but the way he talks about the women is just he 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 seems to identify with the murderer, even though he doesn't know who the he's murderer is. Andrew uh, Mayo, he agrees with you completely, Rachel. He he basically said the thing that's wrong with it is the misanthropy and misogyny have both been allowed to mm. grow wild and go crazy. And it, it, it's, I suppose because it's uncoupled, he says something in All the Devils Are Here right at the beginning about T.S. Eliot, which had really struck me, which is that the famous line on Margate Sand, full stop, I'd never noticed the full yes, stop I know, before. I, I think that's brilliant, that bit. I think that's uh, really good. I connect nothing with nothing. And then he says it's the first and only time that T.S. Eliot transcribed something that was in front of him, which is incredibly powerful because this idea of mm. Eliot recovering. But in a way, that's what Seabrook does throughout this book. He kind of transcribes what's in front of him. And he starts hairs Whether running. it's there or not. Whether it's there or not, which is... And he which doesn't is, ever check anyone's story no. either, does yeah. he? I no, mean, no Gordon says, I had sex with Freddie Mills. Yeah. He, doesn't he doesn't try... He doesn't say, you know, did he this happen? He, doesn't, he just leaves it there, yeah. as it were, for you to... That's what makes this book. And I think it's extraordinary. It's like one of those sort of dark flowerings that English literature throws up, sort of Death's Jest book by Thomas Lovell Beddoes, mm -hmm. which almost nobody's read, or Confessions, Scottish literature, Confessions of a Justified yes, Sinner yes. by James Hogg. Yeah. You know, these are really odd, strange, 
not get roundable books. This book, it will haunt me for, you know, for, for you a know, long the thing time. About, the thing about this book, I notice when I, when I told people that we were doing this book on Backlisted, what you find is that most people haven't heard of it, yeah. but the handful of people who have heard of it are passionate about it. Yeah. Like So Andrew Mayle, who I mentioned, he really likes it. Um, Jason Hazley. Currently Britain's best-selling author because he is the co-author of the Lady Bird parody <laughs> books. Right. Mm. He is obsessed with this book. Mm. I was delighted that anybody was giving it some time and space, which I is mean, brilliant. What I would say is that it's a great antidote to a lot of things that are very prevalent in our literary culture. So it's not... I mean, this comes from the time of psychogeography and now we're into the new nature writing mm. and a lot of those books are so overwritten this book's the opposite of that. He he, it's almost, he doesn't try. He doesn't yeah. try. I mean, yeah. he he's a good writer inherently. He doesn't but work it up. And he, he sometimes there are repetitions and cliches and things like that, and that's all, almost a part of it. Because uh, you get a sense of the author from it. With yeah. lots of uh, new nature writing books, you don't get any sense of the author yeah. at all. With this, you get a real sense. When you said earlier on, Andy, that the book's about him, and it is about all these yeah, other people, but yeah. it's kind of about no, him. That's, that's right. That's its strength, I think, and yeah. that's what gives it that edge and makes it but feel wild thing, and weird and kind of wonderful. The other thing it's an antidote to is this obsession that people have about likability. You know, yeah. I didn't like that book because no one in it was likable. Yeah. There's no one in this book that's likable, not a single person. No. Yeah. And Seabrook's not likable, and that's yeah. why I like it. The, the books that really reminds me of Nigel Richardson. Have you ever read Nigel Richardson? It is a kind of less dysfunctional version of this. He wrote a book called Dog Days in Soho. He wrote a really mm. wonderful book about Brighton called Breakfast in Brighton, oh, right. which is oh, kind, of, which that. is wonderful. It starts with him walking yeah, in Brighton, yeah, and yeah. painting in someone's house, mm. and he gets obsessed by this painting, and he hangs out in this pub in Brighton, meets all these people that swirl in and swirl out, and tells all the kind of strange stories about Brighton. They're very similar, but not as crazy as Ma- <laughs> not as crazy. Matthew, have you got a tenuous link this time? Well, the, so the the weird thing about this book is there are so many threads in it that literally, like <laughs> Rachel was saying earlier, that thing about you pick it up and you think it's written for you. You know, I had exactly that sense as well. So there's, it was really impossible to find anything because on every page there's something really from Donald Sindon's memoir. I'm probably the only person under 70 <laughs> who's read Donald Sindon's memoir, which is wonderfully called A Touch of the Memoirs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, Stephen that's, Toast. That's wow. referred to, that's wow. referred to wow. in uh, in this book. Or 39 Steps, I'm talking about John Buchan. I work with John Buchan's grandson, Toby Buchan. Toby. Mm. Wonderful Toby Buchan, kind of fantastic editor. And really, really, everywhere you turn, there's, there's stuff like that. The other person it reminds me of, I don't know if anyone's read Jonathan Rendell. Do you like yeah. Jonathan Rendell? Yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah. His, I don't know, something about the Jonathan Rendell's personality yeah. that is very fragile. Also, um, yeah. He wrote that amazing book, This Bloody Mary's the Last Thing I Own. Yeah, I think you're right about that, definitely. Also died sadly young. Died kind of sadly young. One thing I would say is this book kind of gets into you and it becomes, I mean, it had a huge influence on me when I wrote my book about the 50s and that book has a lot of footnotes some critics hated that but I love footnotes and and that was all entirely down to this book because right. I decided I wanted to write a dig- digressionary sort of book and I managed to put a little tribute in to David Seabrook because one of the women in my book had worked for Lord Northcliffe the owner of the Daily Mail and he had a house at Broadstairs. Right. And I put this in the book for no other reason than for David Seabrook, really, because it hadn't pertained not at all to my <laughs> thesis. But one day, Lord Northcliffe was on the beach with one of his editors, Hamilton Fife. And Hamilton Fife was very, very shocked because uh, Lord Northcliffe picked up his walking stick and he bashed a seagull and then he beat it to death on the sand <laughs> and I thought that was so Seabrookian yeah, and it, that should be in here shouldn't <laughs> it um, it will always be with me this book I, funnily enough I found it very influential when I reread it this week I realised that I had inadvertently I mean I'd name check it in the year of reading dangerously but I'd lifted a couple of things but I love books of which this is a great example of the thing that you were talking about Rachel where the author becomes impatient (laughs) seemingly with the reader even as they are writing the book and will turn Mm. to the reader 
to say, but what about this? Mm. Yeah. And there'll be a little, or there'll be some little piece of grumpiness or bad temper. Yeah. And Roger Lewis, you mentioned with, mm. in the the private little book, we've talked on this podcast about Roger Lewis's Peter Sellers book. That's a brilliant example of it. Footnotes which are there purely to allow Lewis to <laughs> bang the table and tell the reader how God, cross he is. I could talk about that book all day because I was at the Sunday Times when that was we serialised that at the Sunday Times that Sellers book. I was a very young girl then, and oh, Roger Lewis. Well, <laughs> you can't see it, but Rachel's holding her head in her hands as she says that. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we we probably ought to draw it to a close. Uh, we should also say that this is the first full podcast that we've done on a non-fiction book. So thank you, Rachel, for, well, it's certainly introducing me to it. I can't believe, I love that story about you. This is exactly w- w- why we do this. The fact that this book haunted you for all those years until you found it. It's going to haunt me now forever as well. Thanks to Rachel Cook, to Matthew Clayton, and once again to our sponsors Unbound. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at BacklistedPod, on Facebook at facebook.com uh, forward slash BacklistedPod, and on our page on the Unbound site at unbound.co.uk forward slash Backlisted. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with another show in a fortnight. Until then... Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. You can download All the Devils Are Here right now. now.